Welcome to our final presentation of Financial Planning Day. Thank you all for joining us for this presentation. And if you have been at our other events today, thank you for joining us for those as well. It's been a great day here at the library and on Zoom. So I'll let uh, Chris take it from here. Thank you, Jonathan. I just want to start by saying thank you so much to the library. This is our 10th year doing Financial Planning Day at the library. What a great partner the library always is. Um, so welcome to our final presentation of Financial Planning Day 2024. It's always fun to add, uh, to end on uh, tax with Larry Pond. <clears throat> I just personally have to say, I love listening to Larry talk about taxes. I always come away with a big smile on my face with all of his fun facts to know and tell, um, his enthusiasm. It just, it makes you want to think about taxes all the time. So I know when Larry puts up his first slide, it will have the litany of uh, basically the letters after his name. I did not <laughs> write that down today. So you can take a look at that. But um, I know that anybody who's attended financial planning days in the past is, is very familiar with Larry and his knowledge, extensive knowledge and great attitude. There we go. There's Larry, maybe you can even start with what I, I know CPA uh, PFS, that's the personal financial uh, designation, the planning designation for CPAs. And I know CFP, which is Certified Financial Planner, but what's the rest of your letters? Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. And thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, the San Francisco Main Library. It's been a great day today. We started out with learning about investments. And then Heather did an excellent job talking about retirement plans. And then Brian scared the heck out of me about insurance. So that was all good. And guess what? All the topics we heard earlier today ties into tax. So we're going to be looping it all together. So we're going to have a good time. So a little bit about me. I'm Larry Pond. I was born in San Francisco. And my tax credentials are I'm a CPA, I'm an EA, and a USTCP. My financial planning credentials are I'm a CFP, a PFS, and an AEP. I'm located here in Redwood Shores, California. I've been a tax professional since 1986, and I love talking about taxes. I also teach income tax at the College of San Mateo. So that's about me. So Chris is going to be uh, monitoring your questions in the Q&A, and um, she'll, she'll interrupt me whenever a really good question comes up. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, how much time do we have till... Um, we're going to wrap up at 5 p.m., right? 5 p.m., yes. Okay, so we got plenty to cover. So we're going to start with the Social Security update. We're going to start with that because we just got some recent announcements about Social Security. Then we're going to talk about some future tax changes, especially ones that we know about that's going to happen. And so I'm going to spend a bunch of time talking about uh, a tax bill that passed in 2017 called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It's also known as TCJA. Um, that's expiring at the end of 2025. And this was passed uh, during our former president's first term. And we've been living under that uh, since 2018. And it's going to expire in 2025. So starting in 2026, we're going to have some significant tax changes. So it's important for us to know about those changes and be aware of them and not get caught by surprise. And also be really careful what you hear in the news because I watch the news and I yell at my TV a lot when the regular media doesn't get it right. They usually don't because they're not tax experts. So I like to I like to read the tax journalists are out there who know something about tax and, and they're they're usually pretty good. But the general media, no, they're not, especially the politicians. They know nothing about um, what they're talking about and they make things up. And then, and then after that, after we talk about the tax cut jobs, Act, we're going to talk about the presidential candidate tax proposals. You know, I see we already had a question about um, Vice President Kamala Harris's tax proposals and and former President Trump's proposals. We'll talk about that and the likelihood of any of those uh, their proposals passing. One thing I got to warn you: we're in America, and the way things work in America is that laws are written by Congress. So if you want to make any changes to any law, especially the tax law, it's got to be passed by Congress. And presidents can say whatever they want, and every president's been doing that for uh, the couple of last centuries. And so just because they say it doesn't mean it's going to happen. 
And then we're going to close with what you can do to reduce your tax bill for this year, for 2024. Now, I'm coming back in January, and Jonathan's going to post um, the announcement of that song. So uh, in January, I'll be coming back because January will be more specific about tax season, about your 2024 tax returns. And by then, we're going to know a whole lot more about what's going to possibly happen because we'll know, you know which way the the uh, the um, Congress is leading. Is it going to be a split Congress like we have right now? Uh, who's the president and all those kind of things. And also there's going to be a lot, lot going on. So um, uh, that'll be the January presentation. So this presentation, we're not going to go over tax forms or, or just a lot of changes for 25 that have not been announced yet. So we'll know that in January. Okay, so let's start with the Social Security update. So the Social Security Administration just released the 2025 cost of living increase. And, uh, you know, you hear the news uh, about inflation, about what the numbers are and all that. So one thing I need to alert you to is every government agency and even, even certain provisions use different measures of inflation. So uh, during the Obama administration, when Obama was president, the inflation factor that the Social Security uses was changed. It's called uh, CPIW or um, chained inflation. So chained inflation means that uh, when inflation changes, when it goes up, it goes up kind of slow. When it goes down, it goes down kind of slow, kind of steady things up instead of the big ups and downs that can happen with inflation. So... The, so because inflation has gone down, inflation has gone down. And one thing you need to understand, with the reduction of inflation, it doesn't mean prices are dropping. And that's a misunderstanding a lot of people have. And a, a certain presidential candidate keeps harping on it, uh, as uninformed as he is, saying that uh, inflation is horrible. No, it's not. It's 2.5%. So what that means is your if you're collecting Social Security right now, um, it's your benefits are going to go up by 2.5%. So take a look at what your current uh, Social Security uh, payment is. Multiply that by 102.5%. Now let you know what next year's is going to be. Okay, let's look at look at what the increases we've seen in the past. So in 24, it was a 3.2% increase. But look at 23. Wow, 8.7. 8.7, remember that? We had super duper high inflation in 2022, um, which is why the the increase was 8.7%. That was pretty significant. In 2022, it was 5.9%. And then 21, 1.3, that's where it's been. The highest in history of an increase was way back in 1981. Remember that? I remember that. Uh, we had super high inflation when when you when you bought a house back then you were you were happy to get a fifteen percent mortgage, you know. So yeah, that's just give me a perspective here. So nineteen eighty one fourteen point three percent. Now I remember was it 2010, 2011, and twenty sixteen, the uh, inflation increase was zero. We actually had negative inflation in those years, and so those years was actually zero. So. You know, that's what's going on here. So that's the uh, Social Security update. What what update we have not received yet, and we're keeping on the news, is the Medicare premium increases. We'll see what that's going to look like. So so number one is the, uh, give me a heads up what the Social Security increase is going to be. Now, what also has been announced by Social Security is if you're working and you're paying into Social Security, so for 2024, um, you pay Social Security tax up to 168600 income. Once you hit that amount, you stop paying the Social Security tax or the FICA, the FICA tax. Uh, that's either if you're self-employed or if you're working for a company. Well, for 25, that's going to be $176,100. 23 was about 160000 So it's going to go up with inflation. Uh, sometime in March of every year, we get the trustees report uh, regarding Social Security and Medicare. And I'm a nerd, so I always look forward to seeing that trustees report. The trustees report tells us when is Social Security going to blow up. When it blows up, it means that it won't be able to pay 100% of the benefits. It's not going to be zero. It's not going to be zero. So the last report we got for this year says that in 2034, if uh, based on the current 
trajectory we're at right now in terms of uh, how many people are working, how many people are retired. They're estimating that by 2034, Social Security is going to be able to pay about, I think what it said was like 78% of the benefits. So it's not going to go down to zero. It just gets reduced. So we know that's not going to happen because politically that cannot happen. It just means Congress needs to make some changes. If we can get some courage in Congress, that'd be great. The sooner they do it, the better. Let's just, you know. Ask Congress or give Congress suggestions on fixing Social Security. A lot of little minor tweaks they can do. It could really help with Social Security. Now, the other thing, too, is that um, is that if you take Social Security early, I know this is not a Social Security seminar. We can do a Social Security seminar. But if you take Social Security early, which early means before what's called your full retirement age. And that's based on when you were born or something like that. So if you're born in 1960 or later, uh, that's age 67. So if you take it early, you can take Social Security at age 62, but you take a substantial discount and you're gonna be stuck with that discount for the rest of your life. So if you wanna do that, that's fine. Some people, I do recommend taking early. Um, the clients I have told uh, to take it earlier, those are cancer survivors because we don't know how long they're going to live or they're currently cancer patients or something like that. So sadly, many of those people uh, took social security early and they, they passed away because of, of their health situation. So, you know, if you think you're going to live past 80 years old, that's around the break even point. You should probably wait. You should probably wait because you take a big discount. Now, if you do take your Social Security early for 2025, you get earn up to $23,400 before you have to pay back a portion of your Social Security. For 24, that's $22,320. And there's these monthly amounts depending on you know how much you're earning. So that's something to be aware of. If you take Social Security early before your full retirement age, you need to pay some back. So just, just, to, just to keep that in mind, and we can also always do a Social Security seminar. That'll be a a big deal to talk about. Okay, that's Social Security update. Let's talk about the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017. This is the tax law we've been living under since 2018. It was passed on December 22nd of 2017, and then it kicked in on January 1st of 2018. Boy, that was stressful for us tax people. I mean, I was so busy, you know, reading the law because it kept changing, it kept changing, a lot of negotiations going on. Um, and they finally settled. The House had its version. The Senate had its version. The president kept butting in. So anyway, so what did the law do? Well, it reduced corporate tax rates. It was a top rate of 35%. It's now 21%. That provision of the law is permanent. So even after 2025, if you have a regular corporation, a C corporation, it has taxable income, you pay tax of 21%. If you're a big corporation, you pay tax at 21%. That kind of puts us at parity with the uh, with the world, with the world corporate taxes. Of course, the former president wanted to be 15%, but mathematically that was not possible. We'll talk about what, what um, Vice President Harris thinks about that. The other big change was that the individual tax rates were restructured and the top rate was reduced from a top rate of 39.6%, which Bill Clinton added back in 1993, and dropped the top rate to 37%. And the standard deduction was doubled. So most Americans are not itemizing. Most Americans aren't itemizing. You're probably not itemizing. Most of us are taking advantage of the standard deduction. So it went from 12,700 to 24,400. So so, the, so that kind of gives us some uh, tax planning um, considerations. Also, we have a new tax. Uh, it was a one-time transition tax on 15.5%. That's if you invested in a corporation overseas. And, and the law before this was that, yeah, it made money, uh, but you never took it back to the United States, so you didn't pay tax on it. But this tax law change forced this to happen. Uh, we had a Supreme Court case uh, that was um, decided this year. Um, the Moors, it was the people who who uh, actually sued the IRS saying that it was an unconstitutional law. Well, it went through the district court, the court of appeals. They were in uh, Washington state. So it was ninth circuit court of appeals and went up to the Supreme court. The Supreme court says it's constitutional. So if you have the investments, 
in companies overseas, you got to pay this 15.5%. That was one way of paying for it. The other changes we had was that there's no personal exemption. So that's that was eliminated from 2018 to 2025. You used to get an exemption for yourself, your spouse, and your dependents. In exchange for that, we had an increased child tax credit. It's $2,000 a kid now. It was $1,000 a kid. And of that 2000 1600 of that tax credit is refundable. Um, I remember one of the first presentations I made on this. Uh, there was a CPA sitting in front of me. He's got five kids. And, and so I said, dude, you're getting a $10,000 tax credit. He goes, yeah, okay, all right. Because before that, it was $1,000. Also, what changed with the child tax credit uh, was that the um, income limit was significantly increased. So more people got it. So more people got it. Um, certain members of Congress want to get rid of the mortgage deduction. They said that was, a, that was a tax benefit for the rich, but they were able to keep it. But the compromise was only on up to $750,000 of principal for any mortgages that you got after December 15th of 2017. So good luck buying a house with a $750,000 mortgage in San Francisco. But that's what we've been living under for the last few years. So we'll talk about what happens after 2025. Uh, most controversial one you hear in the news is called the SALT limit, state and local tax. Uh, you can pay a whole lot more than $10,000 in property taxes and income taxes, but you can only deduct $10,000. And I had a client that uh, he paid $50,000 in property tax for his house in Los Altos, and he had a $3.5 million California tax bill. Guess how much you can deduct? $10,000. So he's the one who keeps sending emails of why he hates California. Well, also, since he, he had such a high income, in California, you have the mental health tax. And so if you make more than a million dollars, you're helping California's mental health. It's an extra 1% tax. So people laugh at California about that. But hey, we got the mental health tax. Uh, certain members of Congress want to get rid of the alternative minimum tax, which is a big deal here in the Bay Area because um, you know almost everybody was, was hit by it. Uh, <clears throat> didn't get rid of it, but uh, the exemptions and the phasos were significantly increased. So very few people have been subject to it to the last few years. Uh, the big changes in gift and estate taxes, uh, the basic exclusion has been doubled. Back in 2017, it was 5 million, got doubled to 10 million. Today, that basic exclusion is $13,610,000. So you don't pay any estate tax until you have more than $13,610,000 of a taxable estate. Big, big deal. Now, of course, the former president wanted to get rid of Obamacare, but that didn't happen. But what did happen was the health care mandate penalty has was eliminated since 2018. So if you don't have health insurance, no penalty. However, California still has that penalty. It's on line 92 of your form 540. It's called the Individual Shared Responsibility Penalty, ISR. So California still has the health care mandate. So if you don't have health care in California, you got a penalty you got to pay. The P's limitation is when your income's above a certain amount, you lose some of your itemized deductions. So that was eliminated. Um, no miscellaneous deductions. Those are deductions that exceed 2% of your adjusted gross income, which means we can't deduct our wonderful tax prep fees, our financial planner fees, and our legal fees, or employee unreimbursed business expenses. The big deal was during the pandemic, a lot of employers sent their employees home. No home office deduction if you're an employee. Uh, no deduction for getting a monitor, a chair, or things like that. So this is scheduled to expire after December 31st of 2025. Now, a lot of people think, hey, can't Congress just extend? Can't the president just extend it? No. Let me explain why. This law was passed under what's called reconciliation. So when you listen to the news, especially the Sunday morning shows, uh, you hear the word reconciliation, budget reconciliation. What that means is if we pass a law under budget reconciliation, you only need a simple majority in the Senate, only a simple majority. To pass a law without reconciliation, you need 60 votes in the Senate. Good luck with that, right? 
So can we get 60 votes? That's the regular way of passing laws. And we've we've had that for decades and centuries, but not now, not the future. We have such a divided Congress, right? So when reconciliation, the laws have an expiration date, and the expiration date is December 31st of 25. So that's why. Now, it's really easy to raise taxes. You can you can make a change in the law to raise taxes easy peasy. If you want to cut taxes, you got to pay for it. So one thing you got to look out for, you hear this in the news, uh, a, a member of Congress will introduce a bill. It looks great to you and me, but if they don't have a way to pay for it. It's not going to happen. And so those are what's called show bills, show bills. They're just trying to look good, trying to look good to their constituents, but the bill's not going to go anywhere. We've had a lot of those. We've had a lot of those. And, you know, in the tax world, we make fun of those Congress members. There she goes again, make fun of another show bill. So just watch out for what you hear in the news. Just because a bill's been introduced in Congress, it doesn't mean it's going to pass. And we'll talk a little bit more about bills here. On the business changes, on the business changes, the corporate alternative tax has been eliminated. However, there's a new corporate minimum tax. It's more of a worldwide thing, uh, trying to equalize taxes around the world because too many corporations kind of play with their accounting. Um, Ireland's been the biggest beneficiary of that because a lot of Apple Computer says they make a few billion dollars in Ireland because their taxes were close to zero. So instead of the United States, the United States wasn't too happy about that. And uh, they had to pay a pretty substantial penalty for that. Uh, if you have a business, you have business equipment, you have full bonus depreciation for five years. That expired in 2023. And that's been reduced. Uh, in exchange for reducing the corporate tax rate, uh, there's a new 20% qualified business income deduction for pass-throughs because they didn't get the reduced tax rate. But if you're a pass-through, that's a sole proprietorship, a partnership, or an S-corporation, you got this extra free 20% deduction. And then uh, they eliminate the, the 199 domestic production activities. Uh, that means you, you got a tax credit for producing stuff in the United States. All right. So 2026, we're talking about it today, right? It's 2024. So uh, we need to do some planning, right? Because if you want to wait till uh, 26, we're just going to get hit with it. So here's the thing, though. Uh, in my client base, almost because uh, I have higher income clients, right? So so they all got a pretty good tax cut. They all got a pretty good tax cut. I, some people are five-digit amounts. Uh, there's a couple of clients there was a six digit amount. Yeah, that was huge. I said, look at your reduction in tax bill because of this tax change. So just think about it the flip side. If you're if you got a tax cut, if you look at your 17 tax return and your 18 return, your income's pretty similar. You go, oh wow, my taxes are ten thousand dollars less. Yeah, that's probably the average. There's ten to ten to fifty thousand dollars less. Well, guess what? That's your tax increase in 26. So you got to be ready for that. You got to be ready for that because higher taxes are going to come back. The higher tax rates are going to be back and they've been inflated for inflation. The standard deduction is going to be reduced. So it's going to be it's going to be cut in half. So we might be itemizing again. On the flip side, you know, we pay a lot of property taxes here in California. We pay a lot of state income taxes. Uh, so the deduction for your state and local taxes that's going to be eliminated. The mortgage deduction limitation is going to go back to the old law, which means you can deduct uh, interest on principal to a million dollars. That's still a million dollars. And $100,000 of home equity loans. Home equity loans, use it for anything. So that's going to come back in 26. And, you know, this million dollar limit, that was imposed in the 1986 tax reform and I remember that when that happened, I go, I'll never see a million dollar mortgage. That was back in 1986, right? Well, it's not adjusted for inflation. So a million dollars today is probably about $3 million today. So, uh, you know, today we do tax returns with clients with $3 million mortgages, right? And what is a thousand square foot house in San Francisco, maybe? I don't know. I'm just kidding. Okay. Miscellaneous itemized deduction is going to be back. We'll talk a little bit about more in detail. Personal exemptions will be back, but then you have a lower child tax credit. And P's limitation on itemized deductions is going to be coming back, which is no fun because I can't just add up your itemized deductions. There's that calculation you got to do saying, oh, yeah, you got you got 30 grand of itemized deductions, but you can only deduct 24 of it or whatever. So <clears throat> that's going to come back. 
So here's a chart of the standard deductions uh, that we've seen. Now, if you notice the increase from 22 to 23, I put that in there because of the high inflation we had. Pretty big jumps. Let's focus on the merit filing jointly from 25,009 to 27,700. That's a pretty big jump. For 24, uh, if you're a married couple, your first $29,200 of income is tax free. Tax free. Single, 14,006. Now, if you're over 65, uh, you get a bump up. Uh, and if you're blind, you get another bump up. So if you're married over 65, the first 32,000 of your income is tax free. So that's something to consider. Now, we haven't got the announcements for 25 yet. So I'm sure we'll know that usually comes out in November. So in January, we'll know what the 25 amount's going to be, but then that's going to give us a heads up of what 26 is going to be. It's going to be half of those amounts. So that's going to be a big change. So what that means is, let's say, let's say the 25 verifying joint is $30,000. Okay. So what's 26 going to be? It's not 30,000. It's going to be 15,000. So instead of the first 30,000 of income being Tax free, only fifteen thousand is tax free. So be aware of that. Be aware of that. Okay. So what's going to happen? Child tax rate is going to be reduced. Instead of two thousand dollars a kid, it's going to drop back to a thousand dollars a kid. In the current law, the way it's written, it's not indexed for inflation. It was a thousand dollars every year. It doesn't get adjusted for inflation. So, but in the Kamala Harris tax plan, she wants to make it adjusted to inflation. So we'll see what happens with that. Currently, the qualified business income deduction is going to be eliminated for many people. That's a substantial deduction. Now, we'll see if that gets extended. But if it gets extended, how are you going to pay for it? Uh, for alternative minimum tax, we're probably going to see more people subject to that, especially here in the Bay Area. Uh, charitable deductions. Uh, right now, you can deduct up to 60% of your gross adjusted gross income for cash donations. That's going to drop to 50%. Oh, like Brian was talking about insurance, right? The, the wildfires, the hurricanes, the tornadoes and all that. Well, if you have a loss that's not covered by insurance, you can only deduct them on your tax return if it's from a presidentially declared disaster. Oh boy, I, I, I've had so many clients who are in the wine country, Sonoma, Santa Rosa. Some of them were in the news. It's like, hey, that's my client's house. It's in the news. Um, Totally gone, right? Totally gone. And of course, insurance didn't cover it all. So, but because they were presidentially declared disasters, we can deduct them. So, you know, we always get, I always get a client with the question, hey, my bike got stolen. Can I write that off? Well, no, unless it was part of a presidentially declared disaster. My car got stolen. Well, if your car got destroyed in the presidential declared disaster zone, like the wine country fires or all those different fires we had. Actually, there's a fire now, isn't there? Uh, you know, those can be deducted. But if it's outside of that, no. If your car catches fire and it's uninsured, as un unless it's in a presidential declared disaster. That's claim on Form 4684. On the upper right-hand corner of the form, there's a FEMA code. And the FEMA code is for the presidential declaration. So if you don't have one of those and you submit this on your tax return, it's going to get rejected. The IRS will disallow the loss. Now that's going to go away in 26. Uh, if you have excess business losses, there are certain limitations on that right now. That's going to go away. One of the tax playing tools we had was what's called qualified opportunity zone investments, which means if I have a capital gain, and I invest in a qualified opportunity so I can defer the tax to 2026. And if I hold it long enough, I get some increases in basis. Don't know if that's going to get extended or not, but the people who sell these kind of funds have a high level of confidence. They will be, but we'll see what happens. It was uh, written by uh, a couple of senators, uh, Cory Booker and Tim Scott. So, so they're, they're pushing to get this continued. So we'll see what happens. So those are the two members of Congress. All right. The other big change is the state and gift tax changes. So, you, you know, if you haven't reviewed your estate plan, get it reviewed, especially with these significant changes here. So the exclude, what the exclusion means is you don't pay any estate tax unless your income, uh, unless your assets exceed a certain amount. For 2024, that's 13610000 It was a significant increase 
from 22 to 23 because of high inflation. So in 26, it's going to drop in half. $7 million maybe. That's our guess right now. Now, a little bit of history. The estate tax has been with us for over 100 years. 1916, I think. 1916. Because uh, I remember I was at an event. We had a birthday cake for the estate tax. So was, I think it was 1916. And then the gift tax came a few years later because rich people were giving away all their stuff and then avoiding the estate tax. And Congress said, oh, we better have a gift tax too to capture all that money. So we have a gift tax. So what's the difference between estate tax and gift tax? It depends on the, the, the state of the donor. If the donor's alive, it's a gift tax. If the donor's deceased, it's an estate tax. So that's always a question you have. Oh, you got a gift. Was a person alive or not? So just, uh, it's the same tax. If you have, are you lucky enough to have assets above this amount, uh, the tax is at 40%. So it's 40%. That's what it currently is. It's been 40% for decades, I think. So here's a chart of how the tax brackets changed. So before the Tax and Jobs Act, it's the same number of brackets, 10, 15, 25, 28, 33, 35, and 39.6. That was, so flip this over in 26, we're going to go back to those tax brackets. And then the post-TCJ is what we've been living under for the last few years, since 2018. 10, 12 instead of 15, 22 instead of 25, 24 instead of 28, 32 instead of 33, 35 is 35, instead of 39.6 is 37. So a lot of people got a reduction in tax because of the shift in the uh, tax brackets. So here's a picture of the 2018 uh, tax rates. So just kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like here and how they compare. You know, where, where do you fit in based on your income? So in the lower brackets, not much of a change. Higher brackets, significant change. So the top bracket went from 39.6 to 37. So to be hit with a 37% bracket, you had to have $500,000 or more income if you're single. And this is for married. So that's 600,000 instead of 480. For 2024, you hit the top bracket at 731,000. If you're single, 609,000. So that's the top rate. You know, so most of us are probably around the 22% bracket, maybe somewhere around there. So it depends on what your level of income is. But uh, this gives you an idea of what bracket you have. So what's a bracket mean? A bracket means if my income is above the higher number here, any dollar above that is what I'm taxed at. So a lot of people think, oh, I'm being taxed at the top bracket. I said, no, you only make 100 grand. You're only in the 22% bracket. You're not in the tax top bracket. I know. It always feels like you're paying a lot of tax. It always feels that way. But here's what the tables look like. So let's talk about tax planning here, tax planning here. So so I know a lot of the investment planners uh, would, would, would talk to us about, oh, let's uh, harvest losses. Well, that's a strategy, but you know, if the market's been going up, why do you have losses? I, I can never understand that. But anyway, the sophisticated tax planning you should do is take a look at your portfolio. We talked about investments this morning. Take a look at any unrealized gains. So you might want to harvest capital gains uh, before 2026, because we got these favorable tax rates, favorable capital gains rates. And um, if you have a gain, and I, I think I think we talked about wash sales, wash sales only apply to losses. What a wash sale means is I sell a security and I buy it right back, plus or minus 30 days, that loss is disallowed. Well, there's no such thing for gains. No such thing for gain. So you can, if you're really in love with a certain security, a stock or an investment, you can buy it right back. So here's a chart of the current long-term capital gains rate. So this has changed from before 2018 is that you have a choice of 0%, 15%, or 20%. And we love to take advantage of the 0%. So again, let's look at merit filing jointly. If your taxable income, not just a gross income, taxable income is uh, is 94,000 or less your capital gains are at zero and that also includes qualified dividends uh from your stock and mutual fund and ETF investments so 
that's why it's a good idea to pay attention to how your assets are allocated, you know, how much do you have in stocks and how much is throwing off qualified dividends. Qualified dividends are taxed at these rates. Most people are probably in the 15% capital gains rate, but that's still going to be significantly less than the ordinary tax rate. Again, let's look at the middle one here, Merit Jointly. You're paying 15% on capital gains between 94000 and 583000 Now, if you want to be careful of your tax planning, if you're married, we want to keep your income below $250,000. If you're single, we want to keep your income below $200,000 because that would avoid the 3.8% net investment tax surcharge. So, you know, when you're doing tax planning, it's multivariable planning. You know, it's not just one number, multiple numbers. So you just got to take it, take it slowly. So before the Tax and Jobs Act, the capital gains were based on which tax bracket you're in. So we're going to see this again in uh, 2026. So if 0%, you're in a 15% bracket or lower, right? Uh, you're in a 15% bracket if you're either in a 25, 28, or 33, or even a 35% bracket. That's 15%. And then if you're in the top bracket, it's a 20% rate. So, you know, it's, it's all about planning. You, you, you know, that's why I want to harvest losses. So I want to harvest gains. So it's all your overall planning. And you need to look at what your unrealized gains are and your unrealized losses and, and be very careful with that. Okay, child tax credit. Phase out thresholds. So, you know, it, it was $1,000 a kid. Now look at the look at the phase out. So phase out means you don't get this credit if your income's above this amount. So before the tax and jobs act and after the tax and jobs act, if you're merit and joy, if you had more than one hundred ten thousand in income, you didn't get a credit for your kids. It didn't make a difference. Uh, for single, it's seventy five thousand. Well, for the last few years since 2018, 2018 to twenty twenty five, it's four hundred thousand um, dollars. And if you're not married, it's two hundred thousand dollars. So that means you got that two thousand dollar credit per kid. That's a big deal, right? So, um, so we're going to see this change here. So, you know, the ideal planning is that your kids are going to age out of the tax credit in twenty twenty six, and yay, you just planned it just right. Now, this is a subject of some interesting conversation in future tax planning. Uh, it's uh, there's different versions of it. Kamala Harris wants to increase the child tax credit. We'll talk about that in a second. And so does J.D. Vance, because he doesn't think people should not have kids. All right. All right. Miscellaneous deductions, 2%. This means if they're more than 2% of your just a gross income, you get the deduction. If you look at your Schedule A right now, you go, where's that line? It got taken away. It's still there for California, because California does not conform to the Tax Gun Jobs Act. So for California tax purposes, uh, the California tax law kind of agrees with the federal tax law as of 2015. So that's where we're at with California. That's why it's a bit confusing uh, with California taxes. So anyway, starting in 26, we're gonna get these deductions back. Tax preparation fees, yay, they are worth every penny. With a good tax advisor, they're worth every penny. Unreimbursed employee business expenses. Form 2106. So, you know, um, however, however, what's going to be important is that when you're working with your tax pro, you need to give them a copy of your company's uh, reimbursement policy. Because here's a mistake a lot of people make. If you're entitled to reimbursement from your employer and you don't take it, you can't deduct it. For example, I had a client who he worked for Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard gave him a company car because of what he did. But at the time, I don't know if they still have the car anymore, but they said, uh, yes, your company car is a Ford Taurus. Remember those? They look like a jelly bean. Well, he didn't like a Ford Taurus. He goes, no, nah, I don't want the Ford Taurus. So he leased a Mercedes Benz. And then he deducted on his taxes. And then he got audited. And this is before he was my client. So I found out about it afterwards that the agent said, show us your reimbursement policy. So he showed him the Hewlett Packard reimbursement policy. The reimbursement, they'll, they'll say, you get a Ford Taurus, you get this, you get that, and whatever. But it was his decision, and, 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 and Hewlett Packard said, we're not going to reimburse you for Mercedes. No, 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 no. Um, so he tried to deduct it. And so if you're entitled to reimbursement and you don't 
get it, get the reimbursement because you either blew the time limit because company says you got to submit your receipts by a certain date and you blow that. And people say, ah, I could deduct one of my taxes. You cannot. Okay. Okay. Home office deduction. That happened to a lot of people during the pandemic, right? We got sent home and all that. Well, okay. If you have an office at work, if you have an office at work and you just like to work at home, that's not a deductible home office. You have an office at work. So uh, it's got to be required by the employer and you don't have a desk at work, you know? So you got to watch out for that too. So again, a lot of people make, make mistake with that. Oh, Larry, I can be so more productive in my home office. Uh, people just keep bugging me all day at the office. I say, yeah, but you got a door with your name on it. So you already have an office. You can't deduct a home office. So that's going to come back in, uh, in uh, 26. So get a copy of your company's reimbursement policy and how that works. Investment expenses, you pay your financial advisors, your investment management, all those kind of things. Okay, um, union dues, right? Those are deductible. Uh, in California, there's going to be a tax credit for union dues. Uh, uniforms, uniforms. It's got to be a uniform, protective clothing, or a costume. So what I'm wearing now, I can't deduct that. That's not a uniform. And a lot of people say, well, I only wear a suit at work or whatever. Well, it doesn't have your company name on it. It doesn't have your company name on the back. And it's not that different colors or whatever. So, you know, it's got to be a, a uniform, a costume, whatever. There's a really interesting tax court case where a person tried to deduct his, uh, his suits, right? And went to tax court. The judge just asked them, are those the clothes you're trying to deduct? He goes, yes, your honor. This is what I'm trying to deduct. He said, and the judge goes, are you at work right now? Uh, no, your honor. There he goes, not deductible. So anyway, um, it's got to be related. I know we have, we've had some of the TV anchors as clients. Uh, you know, you see them on TV and all that. And they, they go, Larry, can I deduct my, 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 my hair styling and all the clothes I wear on TV? I said, you can wear that on the street. You know, un unless it's got the logo embroidered on the jacket. And some of them do. Okay, that's a custom or that's a uniform. Okay, profession-related education. I'm a CPA. I always got to take tax classes to stay up, uh, stay up to date. Or a financial planner has got to take uh, take uh, courses to keep up. And we have continuing education requirements, so those are deductible. Tools, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, um, you know, need tools for work. Uh, legal fees. That's a big one. <clears throat> so currently, you see those commercials from those lawyers saying, "Hire us, hire us," and um, and for most of the cases, those aren't deductible. And the thing is, what's taxable is the gross amount of the settlement, not the net amount, the gross amount. So, so if you are getting money from a lawsuit, you got to get some good tax advice there because uh, uh, I met this one young lady. She got a $100,000 settlement, $100,000 settlement. The lawyers got 60000 of that. So she was net 40000 but her tax was based on the 100000 so basically, she's left all the hundred thousand. Uh, she had to pay tax of like thirty thousand. So she was left with ten thousand dollars out of that hundred thousand dollars. So, wish she talked to us before the settlement. And most lawyers don't don't care about taxes. All they care about is getting their fee. So, Larry, I've got a quick question, and this is really about functionality. Yes. Um, so when you have tax code changes, as we did when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act came in. Um, or if it is indeed to sunset, and you're filing amended returns, you have to stick to the tax code of the year that you're filing an amended return. Of course, if you're amending a 2022 return, what's the law in 2020? What's the tax rates in that year? Yeah, uh, we've seen cases where people says, I don't like that law, I'm going to use this law. You guys changed it, so I'm using that. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. Because there are changes sometimes. There are changes and could be quite favorable, but only applies for that year. All right, so more tax plan consideration. So now this only applies for our wealthy clients, wealthy, wealthy people, not for your average regular people like you and me, like me, because uh, I don't have more than $13 million. So there was some concern in the tax community regarding gift taxes, because we're concerned that our clients gave a large gift and then the tax law is going to change. Is the IRS going to claw back some of those gifts you made. Well, the IRS says, no, 
no clawback. So that's a good thing. So if you make a large gift, there's no clawback. So if you want to make some large gifts, instead of just giving it to your kids or grandkids or whatever, do it via trust so you can trust them. They don't blow the money. We've seen that happen. So you can set up what's called a grantor trust and you can preserve control and management of the property because otherwise it might not go the way you want it to go. So here's the example of that promise of no clawback. So let's say we got Tom... Uh, in 2023, he made gifts of $9 million. Well, in 2027, he dies. Well, in 2027, the laws changed. The basic exclusion amount is now $7 million. Well, does that mean we've got to pay tax on that $2 million? That's above the $7 million? No. What the IRS told us is you take that excess $2 million, you add it to the current year basic exclusion. So 2 plus 7 equals 9 Nine minus nine equals zero tax. So that's what the, the IRS has uh, has told us. And it's like, yay, we got really excited with that one. So if you want to take advantage of gift tax planning, we're under what's called user losing. And what that means is for 24 and 25, if you're going to make a gift, you got to make a gift of at least $7 million. If you do anything less than that, for gift tax planning purposes, it's not going to make a difference in your tax situation. So these are for wealthy people, wealthy people who can afford to give away more than $7 million. So any gift below $7 million before 2025, yeah, will not gain any advantage. So so let's give you an advantage of an uh, example of a married couple. So if you have a married couple, um, they uh, they were going to give $14 million total. Um but let's say the way we would suggest doing it is that one spouse gives 14 million, the other spouse gives zero. So what that means is the spouse who gave zero gets to keep his $7 million exemption. And then um, and then the other, sp the, so you just get to retain that. See, if both spouses gave away 7 million, there's no exclusion left because we used it up. We used it up. So, so, you know, so if you're lucky enough to have more than, 14 million or something, something to think about. Uh, best assets to give uh, depends, right? Depends on the beneficiaries, depends on the situation. We look at, you know, we, the, 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 the property can appreciate, it could be stocks, it could be real estate, um, not retirement plans. So not that. So it depends. This is for people with more than $14 million. Okay. Heather talked a little about, about Roth conversions. So for tax planning before 2026, it's a consideration. I'm not going to say you should do it. It's a consideration to think about because the tax rates are pretty darn good, historically low. Now, which direction are taxes going to go in the future? It's not going to go down because we have the humongous deficits, right? We have a humongous amount of debt. And it's like, my fingers get tired writing all those zeros of what our debt is. I actually lose count of the zeros, but it's a lot of zeros. So um, taxes aren't going to go down. So the advantage of doing a Roth conversion now is to take advantage of the current low rates. And what's the advantage of that? If you have it there for at least five years, any distributions you take is tax-free. If your beneficiaries inherit it, it's tax-free. Now, of course... Uh, if you inherit any IRAs, it's still subject to the 10-year rule, which means you got to empty out the IRA within 10 years of the death of the decedent. So the question is, do I pay taxes now? Or who pays the tax? Me or the kids? Maybe the kids are in a top tax bracket. You're in a lower bracket. So that might make some sense. However, again, we're talking about the Tax and Jobs Act. Because of the Tax and Jobs Act, no more mulligans. You can't recharacterize. Uh, before that, you can you make a Roth conversion. I tell the client, that's a bad idea. You can undo it. Not anymore. Uh, you know, we've seen people make large Roth conversions. And they owe a big tax bill. Like Heather said, there's some situations where it does not make sense. So be very careful. But when does it make sense for Roth conversions? Best situations for Roth conversion. You have a low income year. A low income Your business has losses. You know, instead of doing the very complicated net operating loss rules, very complicated. Well, let's soak up those losses by doing some Roth conversions. Or you sell a rental property at a loss. You might have passive loss carryovers. This happened to a client. He bought a building in 2006. What was 2006? 
sky high real estate prices. He way overpaid for this building because he thought it'll keep going up and up and up, right? He thinks real estate never went down. Well, it went down and down and down. And also he couldn't rent it out for what he thought he could. So he generated a lot of loss carryovers. So he did eventually sell it. He sold it for, ooh, $850,000 loss. Wow. Well, if he did nothing, that would have been a zero tax bill. But why waste a zero tax bill? Uh, we did some math. We had him do some Roth conversions and kept him in the lower tax brackets. So we converted what would have been taxable to tax-free and we soaked up all those losses. So if you're going to have a loss, Roth conversion makes a lot of sense. Next one is you need to bump up your tax liability. So one advice is don't take tax advice from a car dealer or a car salesperson because you know the, the big thing is like non-refundable tax credits. Uh, such as the electric vehicle credits. They're non-refundable, not such a to carry over. So if you get a, buy a car, you get a $7,500 tax credit, but your tax liability is only $1,000, you're not going to get a refund. It'll bring your tax to zero. Uh, this client, she, she got a car. She goes, oh, my salesman says I'm going to get a big fat refund. I said, no, you're not. It's a non-refundable credit. So for her, her tax liability was $1,000. So we did some math. And we did some Roth conversions to get our tax liability up to at least $7,500 to use up that credit. So don't take tax advice from a car dealer, um, hairstylist, or your bartender, all right? Unless your bartender is a CPA. Okay. Um, required minimum distributions. Heather talked about that too. We might want to consider some Roth conversions before you're subject to RMDs because you reduce the balance of the IRA subject to the required minimum distribution. This is some sophisticated tax planning you got to be careful about. Also, you got to watch out for IRMA. That's the income-related monthly adjusted amount on your Medicare Part B and Part D premiums. So if you want to do Roth conversion, uh, at 65 or later, you got to watch out its impact on your Medicare premiums. Now, with Medicare premiums, it's a two-year look back. So if you do some conversions now for 2024, that's going to affect your 26 Medicare premiums. Look out for that. Now, if you're smart enough to know this, uh, you can do strategic Roth conversions uh, because the securities take a dip. You know, hey, I know it's going to come back. It went down. I know it's going to come back. So that's called strategic Roth conversions, where I, I do a Roth conversion, pay the tax at the lower rate, lower value of the investment, and then it'll come back. If it comes back, then you just made some tax-free money. So for example, let's say I have a uh, uh, some investments in my in my in my regular IRA, and let's say it, it was a hundred thousand dollars. But the market took a dip. It's worth 80000 now. Ooh, it's going to come back. I know it will. So I'll do the Roth conversion, pay tax on $80,000. And then it pops back to $100,000 later. I just made $20,000 tax-free. So I don't have a crystal ball, so I'm not comfortable doing that. If you are, you could do that. Uh, or if you're going to move to a higher tax state, you better do that Roth conversion in a lower tax state before you go to a higher tax state. Otherwise, you pay a higher tax on the conversion. All right. So we could spend hours talking about Roth conversions. Charitable planning. Well, okay. If you're going to have a taxable state, which means you might have more than $7 million uh, or so down the road, you know, uh, and you look at who you're giving your assets to, consider naming charities as beneficiaries of your retirement accounts, of your traditional retirement accounts, your traditional IRAs, your traditional 401ks, 403bs, um, because your charity gets that tax free. So for example, let's say uh, you die, you got $100,000 in your IRA, you got $100,000 in the bank. Well, you should give the $100,000 in the bank to a person because they don't pay income tax on that. And you get the $100,000 traditional IRA to a charity. Now, if you don't like them, that's what happened to one of my clients. Her sister gave her her IRA, but she gave the charity her bank account. I said, did your sister like not like you or something? So my client had to pay tax on, on her sister's IRA. So, you know, so something to look at. Check your beneficiary designations. Uh, another consideration is most people are not itemizing. If you're over 70 and a half, 
70 and a half, and you have a traditional IRA account, give all your charity through what's called a qualified charitable distribution. You talk to your IRA provider and say, hey, I want to give this to my charity, give this to my church or whatever, and they'll do that for you. And that's going to be tax-free. That's going to be tax-free. Uh, also, an extra bonus is, uh, is if you're subject to RMDs, it fulfills the RMD. So big fan of qualified charitable distributions. Um, yeah, I, I think fewer than 10% of people itemize. The limit for 24 is $105,000. Uh, also, you can take, uh, as part of the $105,000, you can transfer up to $53,000 to a charitable gift annuity. What that does is it reduces the value of the IRA, it reduces your RMD, therefore reduces your tax. Uh, charitable gift annuities are, are done through um, large major charities like the American Cancer Society, the American Red Cross, every university. Every university has charitable gift annuities. So you can talk to them about those kind of things. I, I, I love using those. Those are great. All right, so that's the 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 Tax Gun Jobs Act. Let's talk about a tax bill. Larry, I'm gonna pass. I'm gonna interrupt just really quickly. Yeah. Um, so we have a question that's the the most recent question that you might want to take a look at. There's a couple of different steps happening here, and so I'm gonna have you respond to that. Okay. Uh, what, do you, what do you see it? Uh the one about the Roth conversion, the ant and all that. Is that the one? Yes, yes, yes. That one. Let me hold that to the end. Let's hold okay. that to the end, okay? Okay, sounds great. I'll stick great. around as long as it takes. So, Thank you. So we'll hold it to the end. <laughs> yeah, let's just stop the recording at that point. Okay, because I got a lot more to go here. Okay, H.R. 7024, the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act of 2024. It passed bipartisan. I like to say the word bipartisan because I don't get to say it as much as I like to. It was a bipartisan bill it passed in February of this year. And then, you know, the way tax laws work is it's got to pass both houses of Congress, pass the House of Representatives. It's been languishing in the state until August 1st. The Senate voted no. They voted no. Uh, largely on party lines, only three Republicans voted yes. J.D. Vance didn't vote. He said he would have voted yes, but J.D., man, come on. So it didn't pass. What it would have done was would have increased the refundable child tax credit. It would have made the child tax credit uh, adjusted with inflation, increase some 179 expensing, that's for businesses. Um, also, some business changes was to bring back the 100% depreciation. Here in Silicon Valley, the research expense deduction is huge. That's all you hear about in Silicon Valley. Well, guess what? You can't write off your research expenses. now. You have to amortize it over five years if it's done in the U.S. or 15 years if it's done overseas. And this would have been a retroactive tax change back to 2022 because that's when the law changed. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. The other change is the employee retention credit. That's a credit for keeping your employees. It would have stopped that for any submissions after January 31st, so 24. We've probably heard all those crazy ERC commercials. Um, I kept hearing them mostly during the Giants games, and that really irritated me um, because they were just promoters, and they were going to impose serious penalties on that. So this didn't happen. All right. Let's talk about where we are today. So this list is the tax bills that passed the House of Representatives. So that meant uh, a majority of Congress has already said yes to these laws. Uh, but it's just the House. The Senate has not acted on this. The first one is the Taxpayer Protection Act. It would increase penalties for improper disclosures of taxpayer data. There was a contractor to the IRS who released a bunch of billionaires' tax returns, including Donald Trump's. I think Jeff Bezos and, you know, some billionaires. So we got a chance to peek at them. Um, but they're supposed to be confidential. So, uh, and I think that guy who did that is in prison right now. But you want to increase penalties for proper disclosure. Uh, the Chronic Disease Flexible Coverage Act allow for high deductible health plans to cover common chronic illness treatments on a pre-deductible basis. So that way you don't, have, you don't have to pay it as part of your deductible. The VSO, Veterans Service Organization Equal Tax Treatment Act, makes it easier for tax-exempt contributions to veteran service organizations. And then the N, Chinese Dominance of Electric Vehicles Act, Vehicles in America Act, stricter 
electric vehicle battery sourcing rules for eligibility of the electric vehicle credit because China kind of has a monopoly on lithium and cobalt and all that. So uh, and right now, a lot of companies are doing some fancy moves to get that those materials and to get the tax credits. So this is going to tighten that up. All right. Uh, other bills that have passed the no foreign oh okay, uh, this one no foreign election interference act it would have limited tax exempt organizations from making political com committee contributions from accepting donations for foreign nationals uh, the house did not pass that uh, we this is a big one this is bipartisan bipartisan social security fairness act so this is for our school teachers right a lot of school teachers. Uh, they they worked in private industry, they became a school teacher, but they don't get their social security because of the windfall elimination provision and the government pension offset to limit social security benefits for those with public pensions. So for example, I'm teaching at the community college now. I opted out of the pension because that would have cut my social security. So I said, no, 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 I'm not going to take the pension. So it's it's bipartisan is lined up for floor consideration when Congress comes back. Okay, so today, Congress is uh, running around trying to get reelected. They're not working right now. They're not scheduled to come back to Washington until after the election. Now, after the election, when they come back, before January 20th or so, when the new Congress reconvenes, when the new president's inaugurated, that period of time is called the lame duck session. Lame duck session. And there's some political cartoons of a duck you know, Donald Duck with crutches. Because, um, you know, at that point, if you're voted out of office, you're a lame duck. It doesn't matter what you do. And we know the president is not going to be the president. So, uh, but the bipartisan bills are probably going to pass them. The budget bill is going to have to pass because that expires on December 10th. We don't want to have another government shutdown. So we know that's going to have to happen. So there's going to be a flurry of activity after the uh, election. Okay, the Ways and Means Committee is the committee that writes the tax laws. So here's another bipartisan bill. Stop Terror Financing and Tax Penalties on American Hostages Act. This is bipartisan. House and Senate. It uh, postpones tax deadlines, eliminate late penalties for those wrongfully detained or held hostage abroad and suspend tax exempt status organizations that support terrorism. Paul Whelan's going to be on TV on Sunday at, uh, what's it, Face the Nation. He's going to, he, he's dealing with the IRS right now. He's been in a Russian prison for five and a half years. And the IRS is all over him for, why didn't you file your taxes? Blah, 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 blah. So this law is going to help our hostages. And, you know, unfortunately we have hostages in, in Gaza right now. So, you know, so, so trying to give them a break, give them a break. So we've had Americans who are detained. And they still have to deal with their taxes. So this is going to change that. Saving Gig Economy Taxpayers Act. This is for our gig workers. Uh, uh, increase the threshold for 1099K filing. USA Workforce Investment Act. Uh, established a tax credit for contributions to Workforce Development and Apprenticeship Act. Uh, Educational Choice for Children Act. Established a tax credit for donations to nonprofit organizations that provide certain kinds of scholarships. All right. So this is all queued up for 2025 tax reform. It's not going to happen now, but going forward. We have the Family Security Act put, put up by our Mitt Romney. Increase the child tax credit to 4200 for each kid, 0 to 5. 3000 bucks a kid for 6 to 17. And a 2800 are free NATO tax credit. A little bit different from what Kamala Harris says. Uh, tax relief for middle-class families. Uh, George Helmy, the Democrat in New Jersey, retroactively limit the assault deduction cap, effective one one twenty four. Don't know if that's going to happen or not. Healthcare Affordability Act, uh, expand eligibility for a premium tax credit that no household pays over 8.5% of their income on the ACA marketplace premiums. In California, it's called Cover California. Also, as part of the Affordable Care Act, Dependent Income Exclusion Act, so you don't count your dependent's income to calculate the premium tax credit. So we'll see what that goes through. Uh, the Tax Relief for New Businesses Act, uh, I didn't write down which, oh, it's backed by the Democrats. This is exactly what Kamala Harris says in her campaign. She wants to increase the startup tax deduction from 5000 to $50,000. Uh, the Employee Retention Tax Credit Repeal Act, 
uh, that basically copies what was part of HR 7024. This allow processing ERC claims after January 31st increase the uh, fraud penalties. Uh, we got a bunch of bills regarding energy and environment uh, and polluter welfare. Uh, Democrats are for that. On the other side, Republicans are interested in Enhanced Energy Recovery Act. That's fracking. <laughs> and then bipartisan. So Democrats, Republicans, and bipartisans, Methane Reduction Economic Growth Act. Housing bills. We've got a bunch of housing bills, affordable housing constructions, new homes tax credits, and combating the housing supply shortage act. So incentives to build more houses. So on the Trump plan here, he wants to extend the tax out jobs because that was his law. Uh, I don't know. Uh, he wants to drop the corporate tax rate to 15% if you produce your goods in America. Uh, and so he kind of spouts uh, tax proposals, depending on where he is. No tax on tips. Yeah, he was in Nevada. Uh, no tax on Social Security. I think he was in New Jersey for that one. Uh, no tax on overtime. I think he was in Pennsylvania for that one. Um, tariffs. Uh, this is pre a civil war. So before the civil war, our federal uh, budget was covered with tariffs. We didn't have an income tax. We didn't have an income tax until the civil war because we had to pay for the civil war. And then we had the 16th amendment in 1913, which gave us the tax code. So there's a great video put up on the wall street journal about tariffs. Go to the, go to YouTube, go to WSJ, and there's a very good video they did on tariffs, the pros, the cons. And, you know, it talks about the chicken tax. It was after World War II that American chickens were going to Germany and Germany uh, wasn't happy about that. So they put tariffs on chickens. So in return, the United States put tariffs on Volkswagens and Volkswagen hasn't recovered since then. All right, the Harris tax plan, uh, she also said no tax on tips, but her version's a little bit different. It only applies for people below a certain level of income and only certain types of jobs. She wants to raise the corporate tax rate to 28%. And it's because we're at 21 right now. The top was 35, so 28 is kind of in the middle. $25,000 first-time home buyers credit, uh, tax credit for developers who build homes. So we saw some of those bills. She wants to bring back, uh, in 2021, we had the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan. And if you recall, that's when the child tax credit was bumped up, 3600 bucks if you're six or under, 3000 from six to 14, and you got it in advance. You know, so a lot of people got some pretty good benefit for that. Uh, she wants to bring that back. That was what Biden wanted to. So a lot of the Harris tax plan comes from the Biden tax plan. Uh, $6,000 bonus tax credit for newborns. Uh, $50,000 deduction for business startups. Keep the Tax and Jobs Act for those below $400,000. You know, that's going to be mathematically interesting. The last one's from the Biden tax plan, which is what's called the billionaire tax. If you're a billionaire... And what's a billionaire? Anyone with more than $100 million of, in, of, of assets. So $100 million is a billionaire under the president's plan. So uh, unrealized tax, tax on unrealized gains. So if I have a mutual fund, I paid 100 bucks for it, now it's worth $1,000. Well, that $900 increase is subject to tax. So we'll see how that's going to go. A number of Congress members are really backing that. And versions of this law has been uh, proposed. So so it's not new. So, you know, it'll be an interesting battle there. So tax planning for 2024 and 2025, incentive stock options. If you have incentive stock options, some special planning we got to do because the alternative minimum tax is going to go up in 26. Capital gains planning regarding your investments, real estate planning. There's a possibility of us losing the, the, the possibility of taking advantage of 1031 exchanges. So you might want to do it while you can. Of course, review your estate plan. You know, if you haven't updated your living trust since 1992, it's a good idea to update that. Uh, retirement plans. Um, make sure you have beneficiary designations there. Um, take a look at that. Gifting. Uh, portability. That is that is if you're a married couple and you lost a spouse in the last five years, portability means we got to take advantage of the deceased spouse's unused exclusion. So that's another hot topic here. Okay, we're at the last part of our of our of our conversation. Last part is about 
taxes for 2024. So we got some tax dates coming up. January 16th, ooh, I, I meant to say 25 is our fourth quarter payment. Uh, taxes are due on April 15th of 25. Uh, and you can get an extension up to October 15th, but you still got to pay by April 15th. Uh, this is the 2024 standard deduction amounts that we uh, talked about earlier. Um, I'm not going to go too much detail here. This talks about the bump up in your standard deduction. If you're over 65, you're blind, you get an extra $1,500 to the standard deduction. So, you know, so that's a pretty darn big deal. Uh, there are some above the line deductions. Don't forget about if you're an educator, you're a K-12 educator. That means you're a teacher, you're a paraprofessional, you're a counselor, principal, or an aide. You get a write-off up to $300 of unreimbursed expenses above the line. And because of the pandemic, that also includes uh, personal protection equipment, you know, face masks, uh, sanitizer, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, home improvements. You got to do your tax planning with that too. Again, don't 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 get tax planning tips from the guy with the apron. Talk to a tax professional about it. But uh, we have energy efficient home credits and it applies to your home and your second home, but not your rental property. Um, you know, so if you make improvements to your home, like exterior doors, windows, insulation, if you get a heat pump, a uh, water heater, uh, or a heater or something like that. Um, you get a tax credit for that. Home energy audits, you get a credit. Uh, you get $1,200 tax credit for uh, certain home improvements. And here's the limits on the specific items. Uh, uh, $250 per door, up to $500. 600 bucks for windows. You get a $150 credit for a home energy audit from a certified home energy auditor. Now, if you get a heat pump, a biomass stove, or a biomass boiler, you get a $2,000 credit. There's no lifetime limit, but it's not a fundable credit. So I can share my personal story about that. My water heater blew up. I, I was supposed to replace it. It was way past its useful life. My is a traditional natural gas water heater. And I just got a, a smaller, high efficient natural gas water heater because have you seen the price of these heat pump water heaters? They're like $1,500 more. And also that would have meant I need an electrician to get the electrical connection to my to my garage where my water heater is. How often can I, how, how can I get an electrician? Because then I need a plumber to install it. It would have cost double to triple the cost of my water heater. So, so what? I didn't get the $2,000 credit. That's okay. That's what I did. So you got to make that decision. Don't, don't buy a water heater just because you're getting a tax credit. Because you were paying three times as much, does that really make sense? Solar, putting solar panels in your house, you get 30% credit for that. Still got that. Uh, let's see, uh, you can't have solar water heating for your swimming pool. So not for swimming pools or hot tubs. I wish they did. Um, fuel cells, you get a credit for that. Uh, batteries, I know a lot of people are getting batteries because we had some people, what, in Napa? Uh, had their electricity shut off because they're afraid of uh, fires caused by that you know we're kind of short of time so i'm not going to go over this example here if that's okay with you okay so this is so you can study the example to see how these credits work so i'm not going to go over that if i had more time i'd do that clean vehicle credits uh i would go to the iris website to look this up because the, the cars that qualify keep changing they're either adding cars or subtracting cars and all that what has changed is that you can get the credit up front at the car dealership now the thing is the car dealership doesn't care if you qualify or not so you can get the credit now but if you don't qualify you'll pay it back on your tax return you'll pay it back in your tax return some people don't care about that i'll get the 7500 dollars credit but if i don't qualify you'll just owe an extra 7500 dollars so so and you'll need to give your car dealer all kinds of your personal information your name your address and your social security number because they'll give you a certificate to get that credit up front now this applies to new cars and used cars so yeah it's through a dealership and all that um there's some MSRP limits. So if it's a if it's a big big vehicle like an SUV or a van, eighty thousand or less. Uh, for other cars, it's fifty five thousand or less. So if it costs more than this, you're not going to get the credit. 
Also, it's got to be manufactured in the United States. Also, it's based on your adjusted gross income. If your income's over three hundred, you're not going to get the credit. Uh, if you're single, it's one hundred fifty thousand. So you're going to be careful about that. So the credit, the maximum credit, seventy five hundred, but it could be thirty seven fifty. So you go to the. Uh, I think I have links here. Uh, coming up here uh, where you can look up the vehicle to see what the credit is because it depends on the components of the battery you know so if you meet the battery requirement or the critical materials requirement you meet both of those you get the 7500 you only meet one of them you get 3750 and i think i have links coming up use cars you can get a credit but it's got to be 25,000 or less frankly do you want to buy a used electric car because how much does a battery cost, right? It's like 15 grand for a battery. So usually, you know, I mean, would you want to get a used cell phone with a burned out battery? So I don't know. I'm not recommending my clients to buy previous used electric cars. Yeah, you might get a great deal, but you don't need 15 grand and you can't do it yourself. A friend of mine tried to do that. He couldn't make it work since he voided the warranty. The uh, dealer says, we're not going to fix your car. <laughs> you avoided the warranty. And also, you can't do it yourself. Those batteries are like 150 to 200 pounds. So not a good idea. However, you have a business, commercial clean vehicles. You get you get up to a $40,000 credit. So that's a big deal for commercial ones. Ah, here's the, uh, the links to where to look up the cars and all that. You got the fueleconomy.gov website. Always changing, always changing. So don't trust the dealer. Okay, yeah, here's some more links on more information about the clean vehicle credit. So tips to lower your taxes now. Now, like Heather was talking about, take advantage of your employer sponsor plan. Uh, if you want to lower your taxes, do the pre-tax retirement plan. So max it out. I, I always do my max it out. Traditional IRA, you got till April 15th to top it off. If you have a health savings account, it's open enrollment season now. Take a look at the uh, medical plans that qualify for the health savings account. Great retirement savings tool. And you got till April 15th to top it off to get a 2024 deduction. If you're over 70 and a half, give all your charity out of your IRA account. And you got to make your tax pay. You want to, I've had people who don't make their payments. They go, oh, can I save money in taxes? Well, pay them. That way you don't pay the interest. You don't pay the penalties. Why make it more expensive, right? It's not cheap. Let's see what else I got here. Uh, how to lower your taxes in the future. Uh, this is more strategic planning. Roth contributions. The backdoor Roth. The mega backdoor Roth. If you have a home, keep your receipts. That's really important. Keep records of any home improvements. That will certainly save you a lot of money on capital gains when you sell your house. There's always tax considerations when we go through life changes. Someone dies, someone gets born, someone gets married, someone gets divorced. S serious tax and financial planning whenever you have a life change or considering a life change. For our business owners, you know, there's the employee retention credit. If you qualify but didn't claim it, you got to do it by April 15th of 2025. After April 15th of 2025, it's too late for 2021. 2020 has already expired. That expired on April 15th of 2024. Now, if you got it, but you don't really deserve it or qualify for it, the IRS has the voluntary withdrawal program. The IRS has given us another special deal, the voluntary disclosure program. That expires November 22nd, 2024. It's a great deal. Uh, you only need to pay back 85%. It was 80%, but that expired back in March. So I know a lot of people who got the ERC who shouldn't have. Also, if you have a business entity, the Corporate Transparency Act, the Beneficial Ownership Information Reporting, um, you got to do it by the end of the year, January 1st of 2025. If you don't do it, the penalty is $500 a day, up to $10,000, an imprisonment up to two years. I know if you have an entity, you haven't done it. Because according to FinCEN, they're expecting 32 million submissions. They only got 2 million. So we only got 30 million more to go. So I bet you some of those are yours. So we can always have a set, another session on that. Uh, more resources. Here's 1040. The instructions are 114 pages. Publication 17, that's 142 pages. That's your federal income tax. It's a great read. And then 
I think Jonathan put this in the uh, links already. Our next session's two o'clock on January 25th. We're going to talk about tax forms and getting ready for tax season. There'll be a little more, a little more detailed than this. And I think that's our last slide, Chris. Um, okay. So we, we have a couple of questions. One was the, this was a very specific about an ant. So I'm, I'm actually going to point you towards the Q and a, if you can see that Larry, there's a, one question that is uh, remains to be answered there. Okay, let's see. Uh, it's the one that says, if a couple are the only shareholders of an LLC taxed as an S-corp and file their personal return as merit filing jointly, are there two K-1s filed or just one K-1 for the S-corp? Ooh, I, I, I have a two-hour seminar on that question alone. So... Whoever this anonymous attendee is, you have to have a tax professional. You cannot be DIY. I mean, we're talking about a whole semester's worth of conversation here. This is a whole semester. Seriously. Oh, it's that big blue book in my bookcase there? That's the big blue book. So um, so I could give you a, a shorter answer, but not an in-depth answer here. So uh, since 2014, we've had some significant tax law changes. So uh, you can elect, you can... You can form your business as an LLC and you can elect to be taxed as an S corporation, but for legal purposes, you're still an LLC. So you're not a shareholder, you're a member. And for state law purposes, you have to follow the LLC rules. For income tax purposes, you have to follow the S corporation rules, which means you follow form 1120S. And so your question is, do I have 1K1 or 2K1s? That's a good question. That's another legal area. That's regarding family law. You know, is it community property or is it not community property? So the official answer is, it depends. So I can do a whole two-hour seminar just on that question there. Oh, it's exciting. It's great. <laughs> I love that. I didn't want to touch that one because I thought, I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't get to see the functionality well, of it. The thing is, here's my advice. If you're going to have a business entity, don't do it yourself. Don't get your business form on one of those crazy websites. Guess who ends up fixing them? Yeah, it's a mess to fix. So do not do that. I, I won't mention the names. And uh, use a real lawyer, a corporate lawyer, a business lawyer, a partnership lawyer. Use a real tax professional. Don't do it yourself. It's too dangerous. We're talking about you know a couple of years of school here. So I'm sorry. I, I I know we're not supposed to promote the profession, but that's why we're oh, professionals. You should that's promote the profession. That's why we're professionals, right? It's, it's very important. Well, well, look at this. Okay, so here's an example. My 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 water heater is making a funny noise, you know, and the guy just takes his hammer, taps it a couple of times, and it's fixed. And I go, whoa, give me the bill. Whoa, why is it so much? Give me an itemization. He goes, okay, well, it cost me this much to come here and like this. And the big number was knowing where to tap. That's the expertise. I like thing, that. Right? I like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so you've got another couple of uh, questions. So we're, we have about seven more minutes. Um, okay. If, if you want to take a stab at any of them. All right. Well, someone had a question of the Corporate Transparency Act. So I mentioned that in the last slide here. So the Corporate, Transax Corporate Transparency Act was enacted in 2021. It takes an effect in 2024. It was a law to catch... Uh, money launderers, oligarchs, human traffickers, drug dealers, and all that. And so if you have a business entity, you got to file the beneficial ownership information. You need to report to FinCEN, which stands for Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And that's a government agency under the U.S. Treasury, not the IRS. They're a separate entity. And you have to tell them who owns your business, who owns your business. So that's what you got to do. If you have an existing business, you got to file that by um, by uh, December 31st or January 1st. Otherwise, there's the penalty and imprisonment. You go to fincen.gov slash BOI. That's the webpage there. You do it. So the question is the sole proprietor. No, sole proprietors are not subject to that because you're not a business entity. A business entity is the LLC. Even if you're a single member LLC, a partnership, uh, S corporation or a C corporate, any corporation, anything registered to the Secretary of State, you got to file. Okay. Is it possible that any tax increases be made retroactive? 
by the new president? Should that party win both houses? Yes, we, it is constitutional. The Supreme Court has ruled you can make retroactive changes. And that has happened. That has happened. Uh, however, it could get challenged, but um, but but it has happened. It has happened. So yes, yes. But again, we have Congress. So Congress writes the laws. The president just makes proposals. So a president cannot enact tax laws on their own, despite what one of the candidates say. Okay, just you know, we don't want a dictator. All right. Okay. Did I get political? I didn't mean to get political, but the thing is, this is the beauty of America. We have three branches of government. Congress writes the laws. The president enacts the laws and administers the laws. And this, the courts um, give us judicial guidance on the laws. So those are three branches of government, and, and that's how it works. Okay, any more good questions here? So... Okay, so you know, so I'm looking forward to January. So in January, we're going to give a quick update of uh, if any of these bills have passed because by then, oh, January 25th, by then we'll know um, uh, the makeup of the House, the makeup of the Senate, who the president is, what bills have passed uh, in the lame duck session. And you know, how many of you guys think Congress is going to kick the can down the road again with the budget? You know, they're supposed to pass a law that covers the whole fiscal year, but they keep doing it a few weeks at a time. You know, so uh, I, I want bravery in Congress. We're, we're lacking that. Oh, actually, I want bravery in Washington. We're kind of lacking that. So, you know. Well, I, I Larry, you make all of these changes fun. So I, we do appreciate that. Okay, very good. Looks like one other question just came in on the chat. I fall under the lower earner credit and have fallen behind on taxes. Any resources? Ah, mm. there are resources. And uh, it's through the San Francisco Bar Association. There's a volunteer group called the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic. And I know they've uh, they've uh, done some volunteer work at the library. So, so, so they specifically help with that. That's different than VITA. VITA doesn't do back taxes. VITA will only do the current year taxes. And I think uh, Chris has put a link to where the VITA sites are. Uh, if you want to see me at a VITA site, I actually volunteer at the College of San Mateo VITA site. That's on Saturdays. A uh, great group of volunteers. And, uh, and the nice thing about them, they have to get coursework. They have to pass a test. The volunteers have to pass a test with the IRS. And the other good thing is they are all supervised. They're all supervised. So the volunteers can do the returns, but someone's got to check them. So, you know, so the, 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 the confidence level is pretty high with that. Uh, there's two organizations. There's the VITA program, and then there's also tax aid. Uh, the United Way sponsors a lot of the VITA sites. Someone has, I mean, do one more here. Someone has the IP pin. Okay, let's talk about the IP pin. That's the uh, identity protection, personal identification number. That's what IP pin is. And if you look at the lower right-hand corner of the 1040, there's a there's a, a, a six boxes there for IP pin. And if you submit your tax return with the IP pin, the IRS will know that's the right tax return. You have to apply for it. There's a forum to apply for. You can actually get it on the IRS website. Just type in IP PIN. You can apply for it. In January of every year, they'll give you your IP PIN number. And that number has to match uh, your tax. Your tax return has to match that number. So the IRS knows it's a legitimate tax return. Now, do I want it for everybody? No, because I ask, what's your IP PIN? Oh, what's that? It's a real pain to get it. <laughs> it's a real pain to retrieve if you lose it. Oh, thank you for putting that on the... Uh, on the here, the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic. Yep, yeah, I found the link to a, a clinic near you. All right, well, it's time to wrap up because Jonathan has been working hard all day long. He needs to wrap up and go be with his family and loved ones. Uh, same with everyone else. I, we are so happy to be um, working together with the library and to have all of you join today. It was really fantastic. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Thank Larry, thank you. It's always a pleasure hosting you. Um, look forward to having you back in January. And everyone, um, we're going to do a, a whole series of tax programs um, January through March this year. Um, those aren't all published on our event calendar yet, but keep an eye out for that. We're going to have some great programs, including a couple from the Low Income Tax Clinic. Um, so um, keep an eye out for that. Um, Always feel free to reach out to the library if you have any questions. We can uh, try to answer your questions or definitely get you in touch with the right experts that can do that. Um, so again, thank you, Larry. And Chris, thank you so much, um, you and the FPA. Um, it's really amazing work that you do um, for the library and for our patrons and the community. Um, and yeah, I didn't realize it's 10 years. Um, that's really astounding. And um, it's, it's just great. And here's to 10 more. Um, thank you all of our attendees um, for this program, and hopefully you're able to attend all four of the workshops and maybe get some one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one counseling today. Um, it's been a great day here at the library. We're uh, just thrilled with how this went, and um, a lot of uh, a lot of people did a lot of hard work, including uh, our two panelists here. So, everyone, go enjoy the rest of your Saturday, and uh, we hope to see you for one of our upcoming programs.